All right, this is going to be chapter 13, cardiovascular system, uh, blood vessels and the circulation, part one. And the two previous chapters that we just talked about were blood and the structure of blood and functions pretty much of the heart. And this is going to be the third part of this, which is the vascular beds or the size of the container that all of the blood goes into. Uh, introduction on this, we're going to talk about arteries, arterioles, and capillaries chemical and gaseous exchange in the capillary beds, and then venules and veins in this section. And if we'll remember from uh, Mr. Blood Cell, we go from the heart, and we are pumped out of the left ventricle into the aorta, which is a gigantic artery, two arteries, shouldn't have made that so small, to arterioles, and then we go to capillaries, and then we go to venules, and then veins, and then back into the right side of the heart. So all connected. Smallest pipe is a capillary. Largest is going to be the aorta, and this is going to be oxygenated side. This is going to be deoxygenated side. All right, the structure of the blood vessels. We're going to talk about arteries, capillaries, arteriosclerosis, and veins. There are a lot of terms in this. Uh, the structure of the blood vessel, tunica interna, is the innermost layer of the blood vessels. Tunica media which is the middle layer, contains the smooth muscle. Now, that's going to be very important. Uh, smooth muscle is autonomically controlled. Tunica externa forms the sheath of the connective tissue around the vessel. Two more terms, vasoconstriction, which pretty much means constrict. So it started off like this, and now it's constricted down. <clears throat> vessel walls contract, and the artery uh, constricts and reduces in size. Uh, vasodilation, relaxation, uh, increases the diameter of the lumen. So vasoconstriction is from A to B here, and vasodilation is from B to A. Arteries, elastic arteries, uh, large, extremely resilient vessels with diameters up to 2.5 centimeters or about an inch. These things get pretty large, especially in the aorta. Uh, muscular arteries, known as medium-sized arteries, <clears throat> or distribution arteries, uh, distribute blood to skeletal muscles and internal organs. Capillaries, and this is the smallest end of the oxygenated side, are the only blood vessel whose walls permit exchange between blood and the surrounding interstitial fluid. So if the cells need oxygen and the cells need their, their blood supply, it's going to come from the capillaries. And we call this capillary beds, and they function as a unit part of the interconnected network, and I will show you some pictures here in just a moment. Pre-capillary sphincter, and this is very important, <clears throat> the entrance guarded to every capillary, and there's a band of smooth muscle around this. <clears throat> so in shock, whenever we shunt towards the core or become diaphoretic and we lose our color to our extremities, this is caused from the pre-capillary sphincter shutting and shunting or causing an auto-transfusion of blood towards the core. And then vasomotion. Uh, blood flow to each capillary is intermittent rather than steady. So we don't have just a steady stream. We actually get a spike along with the pressure waves or whenever the heart's contracting. All right, and these are pictures. If we'll take a look at this, this right here is a picture of the artery, and if we'll notice the thickness on this, the tunica media is much thicker in the artery, and this allows it to keep its lumen, which is down here, more rigid, and it also allows um, the smooth muscle to either constrict this down to a smaller uh, vessel or actually dilate it out. So most of our blood pressure is controlled from the arterial side, from the smooth muscle band, and the thickness of the actual tunica media. Now, the venous side is under low pressure, and this is a vein, lumen of a vein over here. 
and it's kind of out of control and kind of floppy and doesn't really have a lot of a lot of structure these are easily moved this is what we start IVs in is in the venous side <clears throat> so the lumen on the vein isn't very large and that's because it has it's missing that layer of tunica media this does have smooth muscle in it though that will respond to vasodilation and vasoconstriction and here we have a picture figure 13 2 in your book uh, elastic arteries very thick very large arteries coming out of the aorta or this would be in the abdominal aorta or the thoracic aorta um, muscular arteries which the lumens a little smaller in these but these would be just before our arterioles. So these are going to be the ones that pretty much run through most of the body. And then we have the arteriole, which this is getting down to a size that would be considered capillary, which is going to be at the bottom. And this is arteriole right here. These are smaller vessels just before. Now, just after the arteriole and just before the capillary, we have something called a pre-capillary sphincter. And what this does is if the blood pressure starts to get low and we go into shock, it will shut and kind of auto transfuse or move blood back to the core vessels and the core organs of the body. <clears throat> that also decreases the amount of venous return that's occurring on the other side and will also reduce the amount of preload. Now on the venous side, we have large veins and this would be ones found in the superior and inferior vena cava. Medium-sized veins, this would be found in the lower legs, like, say, saphenous veins or brachialis vein in the arm or anacubital fossa vein. And then we have venules, which are kind of smaller veins. Now, these are going to be just on the other side, the venules will, of the capillary beds. And this is the capillary bed down here. Now, last but not least, talking about the capillaries, does everyone see that they are very thin? This allows, and they're very small. This is the lumen size, and it will only allow about one red blood cell through there at a time. So this is very tiny, almost microscopic in, in a sense. And these are the capillary beds. So this is the oxygenated side, arterial side. And what we get here is before we get into the capillaries, we have things called the precapillary sphincter. Now this would be the precapillary sphincter. I've just marked. So, example, let's say the blood pressure in this side is going down. The body would say, I need more blood pressure. So, it would shunt blood away from the extremities. And the way, the easiest way for it to do this is to shut the precapillary sphincter. So, then the extremities don't have blood flow going through them. They lose their color. And this increases the blood pressure in the arterial side for all of the organs that are in the core. Clinical note, arterial sclerosis. And this is a thickening and toughening of the arterial walls. Arterial sclerosis and coronary artery disease is responsible for the coronary artery disease. Now, just very simply, the coronary arteries that feed the heart get plaques in their tunica media, and it decreases the lumen of the vessel. Now this is going to shut off blood supply at some point to the distal tissues or the tissues at the end of that coronary artery. There are two types of arterial sclerosis, focal calcification, degeneration of smooth muscle in the tunica media, it's replaced by calcium, occurs in aging and as a complication of diabetes mellitus. And we have atherosclerosis, and this is a formation of a lipid deposit in the tunica media associated with damage to the endothelial cells. Now, so we get atherosclerosis, a common pathway on this is from hypertension. The hypertension stretches the inner layer of the vessel, and this scarring is what triggers the fat deposits to kind of stick there. Uh, there are some factors that affect this, and one of them is going to be how much fat is in your diet or lipids in the blood. Diabetes, obviously, is another uh, big, gigantic uh, risk factor in this obesity and then stress all of these can cause atherosclerosis early and before before a person should actually have some <clears throat> this is a vessel figure 319 of an atherosclerotic artery 
that has been opened up so that you can see just how bumpy this is all supposed to be just glass smooth in here but it's it's kind of not due to the atherosclerotic plaques that are built up in it this is a cross section of one and if we'll take note this should probably be a lumen on it about like this and it's not all of this area here is a plaque that's built up in the tunica media of the walls and is an arterial sclerotic plaque 13-3 in your book veins venules smallest vein they resemble expanded capillaries medium sized veins uh, range from 2.9 millimeters in diameter tunica media contains several smooth muscle layers tunica externa has longitudinal bundles of elastic and collagen fibers uh, large veins include the two vena cava thick tunica media and thick tunica externa and these are going to be just before it empties into the right atrium uh, valves veins have valves in them unlike arteries and they are folds of endothelium that prevent backflow now since the pressure side is so low on the venous side what we see is is they they're designed to where they won't allow backflow <clears throat> so as the muscles kind of move the venous return towards the heart with each pump of the blood then what we see is is these valves prevent uh, the venous return from pooling in large areas uh, circulatory physiology we're going to talk about factors that affect blood flow cardiovascular pressures within the systemic circuit hypertension and then capillary physiology uh, circulatory physiology the primary function of the components of the cardiovascular system is to maintain adequate blood flow through the capillaries into all tissues of the body factors that would affect blood flow are going to be pressure liquid will flow from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure the largest pressure difference or the present gradient is found in the systemic circuit where blood leaves the left ventricle circulatory pressure is pretty much divided into three components we have arterial pressure we have capillary pressure and we have venous pressure and a very simple look at this is we're going to have the input pressure from the arterial side the pressure that is actually perfusing the cellular environment and then we're going to have the return pressure factors that would affect blood flow continued resistance would be one of those any force that opposes a movement and then we can in this resistance we can get two types peripheral resistance occurs in the arterial network due to the arterioles now if the arterioles are clamping shut this would increase the pressure on the arterial side and then we have vascular resistance resistance of blood vessels to blood flow now this could be caused from atherosclerotic plaques if they have these plaques built up in them they will not be as elastic as they once were viscosity also comes into, into a factor on this resistance from the molecules suspended in the liquid the thicker that it is the harder that it is to pump and the higher the blood pressure and then turbulence irregular surfaces caused by injury or disease so if we have a lot of these plaques like that one vessel that was all rough does it make sense that that would increase the turbulence that was actually there and also increase the pressure interplay between pressure and resistance uh, is another term here systemic pressure is highest in the aorta and lowest in the vena cava <clears throat> cardiovascular pressures within the systemic circuit now we have blood pressure which we should be pretty familiar with and we have two pressures that we actually look at systolic and diastolic the systolic pressure is the peak blood pressure measured during ventricular systole or that's when the actual heart or the ventricle is pumping the blood out and then we have the diastolic pressure is the minimum blood pressure at the end of ventricular diastole so whenever the heart's relaxing what we get is we get a variation the blood pressure was the highest during systole and the lowest during the last second of diastole on the the ventricle so when the ventricle at the last minute that it was resting that would be our diastolic pressure capillary pressures and capillary exchange capillary pressure pressure of the blood within a capillary bed and that's talking about the very small lowest areas that there's only capillaries in and the capillary beds and the capillary pressures within there capillary exchange has four important functions and these should make sense if you really think about them maintain constant communication between the plasma and the interstitial fluids so I want to keep communication up between these cells and this extracellular area and this capillary bed 
so that if they kick out a hormone or they kick out something that needs to be run systemically, I can easily do that. <clears throat> Speed nutrients and hormones and dissolved gases, which is another thing, and we just talked about one of those aspects. Assist the movement of insoluble lip lipids and tissue proteins. So all these proteins and things like that that can't really move very easily from point A to point B as we digest them in our small intestine, they have to be moved. What if our toe needs to get bigger? We're going to need nutrients and supply down to the toe area. The only way that they can get there is through the capillary beds. Flushing bacterial toxins and other chemical stimuli into the lymphoid tissues. Now, the lymph tissues is, is something else uh, whenever we take a look at it that essentially, and we're going to take a look at it more in uh, the uh, actual immune system and the lymphatic structures, but it is essentially the trash can of the body. It is essential in the immune system, but any bacterial toxins or anything like that will get flushed out to the lymph tissues. This is also why whenever you have a sore throat that you get lymph nodes that swell in your throat. Those are essentially disposal areas of toxins that we don't just want running freely around the body. <clears throat> Venous pressure is about one-tenth of that of arterial pressure. Two factors uh, overcome low venous pressures. One is muscular compression. Contractions of the muscles near a vein will assist the pumping of the blood, and this is due to the actual uh, the valves that are in the veins, and the respiratory pump. Inhalation decreases venous pressure and allows them to expand. So every time that we take a breath in and out, this assists our venous side or the preload side to put blood into the pulmonary trunk. This is also why whenever you get somebody that is on a vent, if you turn up the peep too much on the vent or the peak end expiratory pressure, that you can reduce the amount of preload that's going into the pulmonary trunk. So this is going to reduce the cardiac output of your patient overall. This is figure 315 in your book, and this is muscles in the calves and how they would assist the venous blood flow to return. So as these muscles contract, what they do is they'll squeeze on these venous structures, and this essentially pushes blood towards the top. Also, the previous valve keeps it from regurgitating and going back down into your feet and ankles. <clears throat> this is figure 316, and it is a graph explaining or, or taking a look at systolic and diastolic pressures. So this is pretty much a very adequate systolic blood pressure, which is about 120, and this occurs during systole or contraction of the ventricles. So this is the highest point here. Now, whenever we're looking at the diastolic pressure, at the end of the diastole or the end of the relaxation phase of the ventricles, this is the lowest amount of pressure that we would see. So 120 over 80 would be their blood pressure. Now, we can also see on this chart that in the aorta, we have the highest amount of pressure. Large arteries, it starts to fall off a little bit. Small arteries even fall off even more. Arterioles, somewhere in between, or the mean of these. And then once it gets to the capillaries, boom, we get a drastic falling off of pressure. So we get about 20 millimeters of mercury of pressure in the actual capillaries. In the venules, it's a little less than 20. Small veins, large veins, and in the vena cava, it drops off even more. So under 16 millimeters of mercury would be an adequate central venous pressure. And that would be the amount of pressure that would be returning in the superior and inferior vena cava. Figure 1317. This is talking about the pressures actually in the capillary beds. <clears throat> and this is the amount of osmotic pressure that's there and the amount of hydrostatic pressure that's there. Now, there's a difference between the two. So this, let's just get an overall explanation of this before we start going through all the, the terms and talking through them. Whenever blood pressure is applied, it gives us hydrostatic pressure. Now, what happens is, is as it gets to the capillary beds, which that's what's exhibited here, if this area has a less pressure than this area, what will happen is we will get something called filtration. 
from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Same way, if this don't have the nutrients that this has from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Also, the thickness or the osmotic pressure of the fluid is in consideration here as well. Now, capillary hydrostatic pressure is greater than blood osmotic pressure, fluid, fo uh, fluid forced out of the capillaries. So if the pressure here is greater than the pressure here, which way does the fluid go? And very simply, it heads in this direction. Now, if the capillary hydrostatic pressure or the pressure on this fluid here and the osmotic pressure, the blood osmotic pressure, the thickness of the solution here is equal to one another, then we're going to have a very balanced environment. There's not going to be no fluid net movement whatsoever. And let me erase this so that we can see the last of it. I got this slide kind of busy at this point. And last but not least, blood osmotic pressure is greater than capillary hydrostatic pressure. Fluid moves into the capillaries. So if this is thicker than this, what's going to happen is, is this is going to try to thin it out until both of these are balanced on either side. Clinical note, hypertension. Consistent elevation of blood pressure is called hypertension. The average of two or more diastolic it, that is greater than 90 millimeters of mercury, and you would, they would say you have hypertension, or the average of two or more systolic that's greater than 140 millimeters of mercury, you would have hypertension. So most of us are really in and probably a state of hypertension at any given point. So we need, we should all should probably watch our blood pressures a little more. Cardiovascular regulation, uh, vital signs, auto regulation of blood flow. Neural control of blood pressure and blood flow, hormones, and cardiovascular regulation. <clears throat> so homeostatic mechanism regulates cardiovascular activity, and that's because the, the activity is controlled by negative feedback systems throughout the body. Ensures tissue blood, blood flow and tissue perfusion. Three things influence the blood flow, and that's going to be the cardiac output, and cardiac output is equal to stroke volume times the heart rate. Oops, there we go, heart rate. Peripheral resistance, and this is going to be the amount of resistance that's actually in the vessels, and then the amount of blood pressure that's actually there. So those are the three things that we should always look at whenever we are looking at how much perfusion do we think the patient is getting. There is clinical notes here, and the clinical notes on vital signs, and vital signs are as followed. Most of us forget this last one, but we should take a look at the pulse rate, the respiratory rate, blood pressure, and temperature. Now, we will see things in these that may give us clinical indications to look at other things. One of the first things that occur in shock is an increase in pulse rate and respiratory rates, and that is in a compensated phase the blood pressure will be absolutely normal during those phases, but these two will have increased the cardiac output and the respiratory rate to try to compensate. Blood pressure is essential as well. If we don't have adequate blood pressure, we can't get the perfusion to the actual tissues. And then temperature kind of gives us an idea if there's any type of infection, we get a pyrogenic effect whenever we have an immune response, which means our temperature increases. It does this kind of out of a defensive mode. Most of the bacteria live within a certain temperature comfortable zone, if you will. If the temperature is too high, they cannot thrive in that environment. So the body escalates the temperature to kind of make it unfavorable for the bacteria to live. These are areas that would have uh, the arteries in them. Some of them are very ideal for taking blood pressure brachial being one of them. We can actually take a blood pressure off of a radial 
uh, popliteal, posterior tibial, and dorsal pedalis. All of those we can take a blood pressure off of if we can hear it with our stethoscope. I would know all of these for the test. There should be test questions in all of this area. All right, so what this does is this concludes part one. So if you have any questions, feel free to call me. Um, otherwise, just study really hard. Uh, part two on this, we'll finish off this chapter, and then we'll go on to the next. Thank you.